All right, would you please stand? And if you need lyrics still, look for someone who's handing them out. <laughs> All right. Welcome to The Bridge. My name is Lane Jordy, and I'm excited to see each of you here, those of you that are in person and online. Um, and whether you are here regularly on a Sunday or if this is your first or second time, we're excited to see you. Um, I just want to make note, um, a few of you maybe have trickled in since Leah made the announcement, but our TV screens are not working this morning, so we're pivoting, we're going a little old school, and we're going to use either our phones or paper copies of the lyrics. So, um, to get 
excuse me, to get to the app, go to the church app on your phone and then click on apps and then August 7th um, worship lyrics. And if you don't want to do it that way, um, just slip up a hand or grab someone. Um, I see Mike Minner has some lyrics in the back and he can get those for you. So don't be shy, raise a hand and get the lyrics. So um, all right, I'm going to go over a few announcements today. Uh, Pastor Jerry will be speaking on a message titled, What I Should Know About Communion and Fitting. We will be taking communion after, um, at the end of service. Um, at the after service, um, we will have a few leaders up front um, in front of the steps here. Um, that would like to pray for you. So if you are, um, if something is heavy on your heart or something you're excited about, um, something that you feel like you need, need prayer for, um, come on up and somebody up here would be excited to pray with you this morning. Um, this week we have some ex fun activities. If you want to pull out this insert with the large black box, um, we have some bridge building events. On Tuesday we have the men's bonfire at the Doherty House. Um, and on Wednesday, we have the women's prayer and lunch um, at the Beal home, and that's in the morning, uh, early afternoon, and in the, af in the evening, we have um, women's walks at Carson Park. Um, if you have not attended an event or have not signed up for one of the aforementioned events and would like to attend, you can still sign up. So please uh, check out online and take a second to sign up. Uh, next Sunday, uh, 412 students, which is all middle and high school students, we are going to have a potluck here in our building. Um, so check the program for details. There's more information there. Um, but all middle and high school students are invited to join us for that. Um, all right, we're going to do communication cards. I thought I had this where I could grab it. Communication cards is the small quarter sheet cardstock paper. Um, this is just a great way for us to know that you're here, a great way for you to communicate prayer requests. So a couple pieces of information. It would be great if everyone would write their name on this card. That's a hugely important piece of information. Um, and a prayer request, if you have a prayer request that you would like to share. If this is your first time joining us, um, please fill out any other information that you are comfortable sharing with us. It would be helpful. And if you're a regular attender and you have any updated information, this would be the place to update it. So let's take just a quick second. Um, we're going to fill these out. Your name, I think you all have one of those. So take a quick second to fill that out. And I'm going to do it as well. Okay, whenever you are done filling those out, there's a little pouch in the seat in front of you. Just slide that in there, and our ushers will pick those up um, at the end of service. Um, join me as I pray for our service this morning. God, I just thank you for this morning. I thank you for the opportunity to be in this building um, amidst technology and difficulties with things not working the way that they are planned. God, you are still here, and you are still good, and you are still in charge. And so we just give this morning to you. God, we ask that you um, would be here, that you would meet each of us as we worship you and as we learn more about you. God, soften our hearts and prepare us for um, this morning. We thank you and we praise you. We pray this in your name. Amen. Okay, we're going to continue worshiping in song, and we're going to sing a new song this morning called Ancient of Days, and um, that's one of the many names attributed to God in the Bible, and this one um, we find in Daniel. He, he had a vision, and, and he says, in my vision at night, I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every language worshiped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away. 
and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. Um, would you please stand and um, let's sing this song, Ancient of Days. God is everlasting. He has always been before anything was created. He was.
Father God, you are ancient of days, and I thank you for songs that remind you, that remind us of who you are um, amidst the good times and bad. But Lord, I just <clears throat> thank you that we can take comfort in you who hold the past and the present and the future and to promise to be with us through it all. And thank you, Jesus, for your love um, that we see uh, daily, Lord. And we just ask that you would help us um, to be able to focus on your word today and just all glory to you, Lord. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. You can take a seat. Good morning. I am Kelly Wichke, but some of you might know me better as Ben's wife or Shay and Ezra and Joel's mom. Or maybe you've seen my name um, because I'm the new admin, admin assistant here at the bridge. And this morning, I have the privilege of sharing with you what God has done in my life. Um, so I grew up going to church, but I quickly got sick of the legalism that I thought that I saw within the church, and it turned me away. I was lost and struggling. At 12, my dad was diagnosed with an incurable but somewhat treatable cancer. By 13, I was diagnosed with clinical depression, and by 14, I was cutting myself and struggling with suicidal thoughts. At that point, I was pretty sure that if there was a God at all, he wasn't interested in me. So the following years were marked with me watching my dad battle and miraculously overcome his cancer um, and finding my worth and value anywhere but the Lord. I started partying and trying to find my worth and value and how much attention I could get from guys. And then I left for college, and I planned on living the same empty lifestyle I had been living. However, the floor I was put on was half partygoers and half Christians. And to my dismay, I didn't get along with partygoers. I got along with Christians. Um, so I spent most of my time with them, which was fine. Um, and I enjoyed them, but they seemed to always be talking about God and church and blessings, and I just didn't get it. Um, they started inviting me to Navigators, a campus ministry, and I went simply just to meet more friends. Um, and I missed the party scene. So when the opportunity rolled around for me to go to Madison Halloween weekend, to go to house parties with my sister, I readily accepted. That first night in Madison, I blacked out by 10, was snuck into the dorms by a friend, and then got to walk home in my costume the next morning um, to my sister's house. So after debriefing with her, we decided I'd have way more fun if I stayed with her the next night. Um, so we headed out to some more parties together, and she quickly got distracted, and I quickly got fed up. So I asked for her keys and headed back to her house. Um, and as I was getting ready for bed, I was washing my face and looking in the mirror just crying, thinking if this is all there is to life, I just don't want to live anymore. I just want to die. I need more purpose than this. And just when I was ready to act on those feelings, one of her roommates checked in on me. So instead of acting on them, I went to sleep, thinking my life needed a greater purpose if I was going to con continue living. So fast forward to the next week. I was at Nav Night, um, watching skeptically as everyone worshipped around me, as I did every other week thinking how weird it was because God probably wasn't there, or if he was, he wasn't interested in their worship. But it hit me. As I was looking at all these people, they had two things I'd been searching for for years. They had hope and joy, and that was just undeniable. So in that moment, I remember thinking, okay, God, I'm willing to give this a shot. And I didn't pray a special prayer or do anything more than that, but I had that mustard seed of faith. And God took that seed of faith and started growing it quite quickly. Almost immediately, um, swearing was lifted from my vocabulary, which was pretty amazing because it was like every other word prior. Um, and I started reading my Bible. And through that, I realized that God is actually not far off or uninterested in me, but he loved me enough to send his only son, Jesus, to die on the cross for me. And that way I get to be with him in heaven forever. And it's actually not because I'm amazing or perfect. As I read Ephesians 2, 8 through 9, it says, It is by grace you have been saved through faith, and it is not from yourselves, it is a gift from God not by works so that no one can boast. My faith, my small seed of faith had been enough for God, and that truth opened my eyes to the worth I have as a daughter of Christ and healed my heart knowing that I had a purpose that was no longer my own or just for myself. Now, my life hasn't been perfect or painless since that day. I've struggled with letting go of many sins. I've struggled with major depression and anxiety. Um, right after Ben and I got married, we entered into some unhealthy church ministries and left extremely wounded. And then we started having babies, and after each of my first two oldest, I struggled with major postpartum depression and anxiety. But God has shown me that even in seasons where my pain feels hard and worthless, that he is there and he is a healer. 
and he's walked me through more growth and healing over the last almost 14 years of following him than I could have ever imagined. I'm so thankful that he promises to finish the good work he started in me, and his promises are my glimmers of hope. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kelly. Isn't it great to hear how God has worked in our lives and he does everyone in a different way as far as meeting us where we are, but we all come through the same way through Jesus Christ who died for us and paid the penalty for our sins. I want to thank our volunteers um, who have helped us this past week. We have had so many volunteers serve, uh, helping us get the building ready. Uh, we're having um, a primary election held here on Tuesday. Required a lot of work to get us ready. And um, so we don't need any volunteers after the service because uh, we're in pretty good shape. So I want to thank all of you uh, volunteers. Uh, I appreciate it greatly. And uh, Bridge Kids, please, you are dismissed. Thank you for joining us. And walk very carefully to your Bridge Kids. So today we're going to talk about communion. We're going to talk about what I should know about communion. It's a very important topic for the church Jesus established it for his followers, all of his followers. That was, has always been Jesus' uh, intention, and it's for the church. And by the way, Jesus intended that all believers be connected to a church somewhere and gather somewhere with like-minded people. Um, sometimes churches rarely teach about communion, it's an important practice for all churches and for all denominations. Um, now, you and I have likely had different experiences through the years because there's a lot of ways that you can actually remember the death of Jesus with the bread and the cup. Um, now, it'd be interesting to hear some of your stories, but I remember when I was growing up... It, attending, our family attended an American Lutheran church. I'm not uh, picking on anyone. I'm telling you, sharing my experience. So um, growing up, when it got to Communion Sunday, the whole service was different. The liturgy was different. We said different things. We had to go to a different place in the hymnal to find the liturgy for Communion. Now, normally every Sunday, we recited the Apostles' Creed. But on Communion Sunday, we recited the Nicene Creed. Now, I never understood why, but that's what we did on Communion Sunday. Now, you had to be a confirmed member of the American Lutheran Church to take communion at, at our church. Um, so communion was considered to be closed to anyone not a member of an American Lutheran church. Um, now, also, before you could take communion, you had to fill out a communion card. You had to register to take communion, and that identified you as one who was prepared, uh, supposedly spiritually, uh, to experience this time of communion with God and with the church family. I also remember uh, when it was time for communion, the ushers would come down the center aisle. You know, we had pews on both sides, and the ushers would come down the center aisle, and one would stand at the front, and then the second one would go through the aisles and invite people who had filled out their cards to come and join them in the center aisle. And once they got nine, they cut off, and they, they, they went nine at a time. And each time you would go up uh, in front of the pastor and there were communion rails so that we could kneel down and then he would serve communion. When he served the bread, it was a little wafer and it had, it had words printed on it, 
but I never was able to read the words because he took the wafer individually and put it in everyone's mouth, so I never could read it. And then uh, we were to take that bread, and you weren't to chew it. We were instructed that in confirmation. We were to just let it dissolve because it would. And then uh, the pastor also um, came with small cups of wine. And, and by the way, you had to be confirmed, so you had to be at least 14 be- before you could have wine. And um, then he did the very same thing. Uh, he, he just handed them to you, and then you could, you could drink them. Um, there was a reason for everything, and in reality, it was hard to understand. Now, there are many different traditions when it comes to communion today, and again, I bet you've experienced some different ones. Um, but the most important thing when it comes to communion is what do the scriptures say, okay? And that's what I want to look at today. So let's have a look. What do the scriptures say about communion? Well, first of all, uh, and you won't have the outline today, but uh, I'm going to look at two passages. I'm going to look at Matthew 26, verses 26 through 29, and then later we'll go to 1 Corinthians 11. So those are the two main passages, and you'll be able to follow if uh, you want to uh, use those passages. Um, Let me just read uh, from Matthew uh, chapter 26, verses 26 through 29. Verse 26, while they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, take and eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup with When he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink from this fruit of the vine from now on until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. So that's what we're going to look at first. Um, Matthew uh, 26. So... Um, let's uh, just talk about the context as we begin with this passage. So this takes place on the night before Jesus' Jesus's death. Uh, there's an amazing amount of scripture on this night. Um, John, John uh, 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17 all take place on this night. Um, Jesus taught Matthew 24 and 25 about future things and a whole lot more on this night because he knew what was coming. Uh, By 9 a.m. the next morning, so this is in the evening and a mealtime, at 9 a.m. the next morning, Jesus will be nailed to a cross, and he knows it's coming. The disciples are clueless. So on this particular night, Jesus focused on eating the Passover meal with his disciples in a chosen upper room. It would be a second floor room, it would be, and the second floor uh, were designed to be large, larger rooms so a group could uh, have a meal together like this. Um, the Passover meal was to be celebrated every year since the time of Moses. Now, it was not, but it was supposed to be. The Passover meal was a major celebration about the goodness of God and how God had delivered his people out of Egypt under the, the hand of and suffering of, of Pharaoh. And this was to be a great salvation of the uh, a great celebration of the salvation of God, the deliverance by God. Um, The Passover uh, comes out of and was first uh, really ordained as a final plague upon Egypt in Exodus chapter 12. And and there were several supernatural things that God did to get the attention of the Egyptians. And the the tenth one was by far the most powerful and the most successful. And uh, that was the Passover. And here's God told his people on this night, I want you to take a lamb for each of your families, and I want you to kill that lamb for your meal. 
And I want you to take the blood of that lamb and I want you to spread it on the doorposts of your homes. And that at midnight, my angel will pass over. Wherever there's blood, that house will be protected. That house will be delivered and the people inside will be safe. Where there is no blood, the angel of death will pass over. And every firstborn child will die. Every firstborn will die in, that's related to that household. Um, and so God's people were to, to gather their families for this meal on this particular night, and God did pass over, and it humbled the Pharaoh of Egypt, and he let God's people go. So... Passover meal was celebrated every year by the Jewish people to remember the salvation of God. Around 1,400 years at the time that Jesus celebrates this, this meal. Um, and so on the night before his death, Jesus especially chose this time to celebrate with his disciples the Passover. It, it was very important to him. The Passover meal included uh, roasted lamb, bitter herbs and vegetables, instructions with four cups of wine. Um, that's what the tradition became. I don't know how many Jesus used on that night, but um, that was a tradition, four cups. Um, and one of those cups, one of the interesting things is one of those cups was one that looked forward to the Messiah. It was prophetic. It looked forward. And here Jesus is with his disciples celebrating, and he's the Messiah uh, when it comes time to share this meal. Um, interesting thing about the Passover meal, when you think about this, those, the food in the Passover meal um, was metaphorical. The unleavened bread was a figure, a symbol that described the haste that God's people needed to get out of, get out of Egypt that night. They were to leave quickly. The bitter herbs was a reminder of the pain and suffering of God's people in Egypt. And so this is going on in the Passover meal right off the bat. There's this use of metaphors in the meal. Um, so Matthew uh, chapter 26, verse 26. In verse 26, uh, while they were eating, Jesus took bread. So we'll just go right back to the text. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples saying, take and eat. And here's what changed everything. This is my body. Never been said before on that night in celebrating the Passover meal, but Jesus brings a new practice, and it's going to be a, the practice for the church uh, until he returns. Take and eat. This is my body. Jesus understood exactly what he was doing. He knew he would become the sacrificial Lamb of God, and those that are related to him in the future. What he's doing, this is prophetic on that night. This hasn't happened yet, but it will happen tomorrow. The night before, Jesus is establishing this, and Jesus will become the Passover lamb, the Passover lamb of God that will take away the sin of the world. And he wants them to remember him. And so he establishes this. This is my body. And then in verse 27, he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them saying, drink from it, all of you. And there's to be a sense. He wanted everybody to participate who, who were his followers. And there was a sense of this thing bringing them into a shared experience. And it also... It would humble them and bring them into a unity under the lordship of Christ. 
Um, verse 28, this, this is my blood of the covenant. That is revolutionary language here. This is my blood, Jesus said. Now, he hasn't been crucified yet, but he will be. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. A covenant. Where do we hear of that? A a covenant, another covenant. There was an old covenant under Moses, the law of Moses called the Old Covenant, and we sometimes describe it as the Old Testament. But the old, in the Old Testament scriptures, there was prophecy of a new covenant that would be coming. Jeremiah 31, Ezekiel 36, there would be a new covenant that God would make with his people and it would provide forgiveness and a new relationship uh, with, with God. Jesus' blood will be the blood of that covenant. It was normal for covenants Uh, for a shedding of blood to establish a covenant. We see it with Abraham. We definitely see it with the covenant with God made with Moses and and, and the nation Israel, the the, uh, Passover lamb inaugurated the old covenant. Blood was shed for the sake. It was a covering, a protection from God's judgment, from God's wrath. A covenant is a relationship with two parties. It's an agreement with two parties. And in this case, it is God and man. The the new covenant will supersede the old covenant. Uh, It will provide forgiveness and it will empower uh, God's people with God's spirit. And Jesus' Death on the cross. His shed blood on the cross will inaugurate that new covenant. And Jesus is teaching his disciples this. Jesus is communicating the gospel ahead of time. They don't get it. They don't understand it. They will, but it's going to take some time. And then in verse uh, 29, Jesus said, I tell you, I will not drink from this fruit of the vine from now on until the day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. And that's Revelation 21 and 22. And and in Revelation 19, Jesus celebrates the wedding supper of the Lamb with his church. That's when Jesus will share this meal again. But until then, Jesus wants us to celebrate it until he comes. So this is where this idea of communion comes from, from Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Uh, Jesus celebrated uh, at the Passover meal and established something new, and he prophetically spoke of the new covenant that was coming after his death. So we come to 1 Corinthians 11 now, the second uh, point. It was given by the Apostle Paul to the church in 1 Corinthians 11. We're going to be looking at verses 23 through 32. Um, And so now we have direct instructions from the church, uh, for the church. Uh, It's for all churches who claim to follow Christ. Now there are some churches who don't claim to follow Christ. Um, And the reason comes in verse 23. The Apostle Paul gave this instruction to the church with the authority of Christ. He said, for I've received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. So this instruction comes with the authority of Jesus Christ. And and Paul just wants his audience to know that this wasn't, he wasn't doing his own thing here. It wasn't just a clever idea. It was Jesus' plan, Jesus' idea Jesus' desire for his church. Verses 23 through 25, um, we come to what we call the elements of the communion meal. And uh, that just means the bread and the cup, or the bread and the wine. And by the way, there isn't like one right or wrong way. You know, some churches use wine. I grew up with that. Some churches use grape juice. Um, It isn't like one is right and one is wrong. Yes, in the, in the first century, they used wine. 
And after the Protestant Reformation, um, people get nervous about having alcohol. And so it's about the fruit of the vine. And that's, you know, it really, at least in my view, doesn't make any difference because what you're going to see is it's about remembering Jesus. It's not about, oh, did we have the... Did we have the right bread or did we have the right cup? It's not what it's about. Um, so, verse uh, 23, the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. Um, on that night, it would have been unleavened bread. It was supposed to identify the hurriedness of God's people to get out of Egypt. And so, uh, that's what Jesus used. And he gave it a new meaning on this night. He took bread, and when he had given thanks. So this is just right out of the Matthew 26 passage, the same, the very same thing. And Jesus gave thanks. If you read the New Testament, that was his common practice, to give thanks at every meal. And, you know, here's a question for us. This is really simple. Do you give thanks to God for your food every day? Every meal. Why not? Good question. God wants us to be a thankful people and to recognize that he is the provider of all that we have. And it, he gives, it can be taken away as well. And I, I, That's not a suggestion. or I'm just telling us this is God wants us to be a thankful people and Jesus is our model. Uh, the, the term give thanks. Uh, let me have a let me have a cut at this. You carry stastos. I won't say that again. That's the Greek word to give thanks. Okay? And some of you know it by the Eucharist. And all it means is to give thanks. And the Eucharist refers to communion uh, in the Roman Catholic Church. Also, Jesus uh, took the bread and he broke it and he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So it was taken and it was eaten for one reason. To do this in remembrance of me. Um, Jesus wanted to be remembered that he would be the Passover lamb that takes away the sin of the world and that it would be his shed blood that makes it possible. And we just, you know, we hear bits and pieces of all the story. Who is Jesus Christ? The Son of God. The Creator God. Now, I didn't, I learned about the Trinity growing up but I just sort of had the Son in a separate category. I never saw the Son of God as being equal with the Father. I thought he was somehow less than. Not true. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and it was Jesus who did it. Colossians chapter 1. Um, think how valuable is the life of the Son of God. How valuable is God's life? The answer is, it is infinitely valuable. There is no limitations on the value of his life. And so when he gave his life for us, there was an infinite payment made for a finite group of sinners. My sin penalty is really big, and yours is probably pretty big too, and we could add it all up in this room, and then we could add it up in our city. How many sinners do we have, and how much sin has to be paid for? And then we could do the U.S., and then we could do the world. Then we could go back to the history of the world. Every person ever born, how big is their sin penalty? You know what? It's finite, no matter how big it is. And God's life is infinitely valuable and Jesus' payment for our sin covered it all. That's why the gospel is still good today and it's never going to run out because of who Jesus is and what he's done for us. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup. This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink in remembrance of me. The new covenant. Jesus' disciples were the first to celebrate communion. They didn't understand it. They were, think about this, and, and sometimes it's hard to put 
the Old and New Testament together, in Jesus' lifetime and in the disciples' lifetime until Jesus died, everybody in Israel was under the law of the Old Testament. We are not. We have not been. But they were up until Jesus purchased their, redeemed them and purchased their salvation. So when Jesus died, uh, he will initiate, his blood will initiate that new covenant. And his blood will be a payment, a ransom for our sin. And Jesus doesn't want you and me to forget this. And it's so easy how we get sidetracked about what is central to our faith. And I don't mind saying it over and over again. It is central. Um, we're going to look at this in just a minute, but sometimes the, uh, the communion is called a sacrament. I per personally do not like that terminology. I'd rather call it an ordinance. Why? Because a sacrament, by definition, is a means of grace. It's a way to acquire grace. It is a way to acquire more grace. Every time you take communion as a sacrament, you can receive more grace. At least that's what it's taught. I don't think that's what Jesus was teaching at all. Um, because it's, it's by God's grace that we're saved through faith. It's not about whether we take communion or, or whether we don't take communion. But let me I'm, I'll explain that a little bit more. Let's get to the meaning of what Jesus said, this is my body. What did he mean? Jesus said, this is my blood. What did he mean? So let's talk about this. There are three main views, and I bet we have people that grew up with, all, with one of these uh, out of the three, or maybe all three, depends on your background. So the first one is, um, it's one of those terms, uh, it's a fancy theological term, transubstantiation. Some of you know what that means. Transubstantiation. It's the Roman Catholic view, um, and some of you may recognize that. And here's what it says. When the, speak, when the priest speaks the words of institution, the words of institution would be when he speaks out loud, this is my body. He's, he's repeating the word of God, Jesus' words. When the priest says that, at the words of institution, something happens. The bread is changed miraculously into the body of Christ. It is no longer bread. It is now the body of Christ. Transubstantiation. When the priest speaks the words of institution and he takes the cup and says, this is my blood, something is changed. It is no longer a cup of wine. It is now the blood of Jesus Christ. It miraculously changes. That has a huge impact on this view. And so for a Catholic to receive Jesus is to participate in the body and blood of Jesus. In a sense, Jesus is killed every time they take communion. But the main idea is they receive Christ through his body and his blood. And that's a sacrament. And the more they do that, the more grace that they get. Um, now, that's a simple explanation. And it's also the classic traditional view of the Roman church. Uh, the second one is the, is the view that I was raised with, and so I had to learn this word when I was 14, consubstantiation. I could hardly say it, consubstantiation. Uh, the traditional Lutheran view. Um, in this view, at the words of institution, when the minister says, this is my body, um, the bread does not change. The same would be true for the wine. The wine does not change. But 
Jesus, at, at the words of institution, the, Jesus is now present in the bread and the wine, around the bread and the wine, and through the bread and the wine. Jesus' presence. And so, in a sense, you're taking his presence. Now, um, again, this, this was called a sacrament. Um, my understanding of the Roman church is there are seven sacraments, seven ways that you can get grace to your account. For the Lutheran perspective, there are two sacraments, baptism and communion, and those uh, are required to receive grace. Here's what I grew up. I grew up being taught that I needed to be baptized as an infant and of course, my parents did that. And then I was taught that after I'm baptized, I need to believe. And I need to learn to be a good Lutheran or a good Christian. I never called myself a Christian. I always called myself a Lutheran. And um, the, the hope was, if you do these things, the hope was maybe you could go to heaven, but you would never be confident, never be sure. It was inappropriate to say you knew for sure that you were going to heaven. And the idea is to believe and be good and hope that you're getting enough grace along the way. Now, the third view, and some of you grew up with this, it's called the memorial view. Um, this one makes the most sense to me from what Jesus said and what the scriptures teach. Jesus held out the bread and he said, so this is sealed communion. Talk about how things change. This is how we got through COVID, okay? It's not right or wrong. It's how we did it. There's a little wafer on top, and there's grape juice on the bottom, okay? So um, he held out, whether it was a wafer, I've had communion with a loaf of bread, I've had wafers, I've had um, unleavened bread, I've had crackers, you know, there's a lot of things that happen that are called bread. So he held out the bread, unleavened bread on this occasion, and he said, this is my body. What was he saying? Was he saying that miraculously that bread became his body? And so that night the disciples were actually eating his body. No, he wasn't saying that. He was saying, this is symbolic. It's just like the unleavened bread that represents the hurriedness of getting out of Egypt and the bitter herbs that represent uh, the awful time that God's people had in Egypt. It was a symbol, a reminder. Let's think about this. Don't ever forget how God delivered us out of Egypt. And now Jesus is saying, don't ever forget how I delivered you from sin. This is my body. It's a symbol. It's a metaphor. It's not my body. See my hand and my arm? It's still here, but there's the bread. And then he took the cup and he said, this is, this is my blood. Did he mean that it was now his actual blood that they were going to swallow? No, it's a symbol. It was, it's a picture. It's, it's to cause them to think. He, just, he took from the Passover meal and he turned it into something for the church to remember him, for his followers. Um, the bread simply represents his body. The cup simply represents his blood. And you know what? This is the gospel he gave for us, his life, for our lives. He was preaching the gospel on the night before he was crucified. This is my body. This is my blood. For the forgiveness of sins. They don't understand, but they will. The purpose, uh, verse 26, for whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, and we do this after our communion service at the end. Whenever you do this, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. When we share this experience, we announce to, to our world. Now, people can't, don't necessarily hear us outside of this building. But the forces of darkness know what we are doing here. And we announce the gospel and the victory of Jesus Christ to the forces of darkness. Um, 
we announce the good news of the gospel one more time. Christ died for our sins. He did all the work. Our salvation never depends on taking communion. It comes through Christ's death and his death alone. It is by grace we are saved through faith. It's not of ourselves. It is a gift of God. It is not of works, lest anyone should boast. When we share communion, we remind ourselves that Jesus is coming back for his church. We proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. He's, he's coming. We announce the good news until he returns. Um, until he comes back, this will be our message. How we do this is crucial. And this is why personal examination is so important. Verses 27 through 32, the Apostle Paul writes, So then, whenever uh, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. It is possible for you to take communion and dishonor Christ, to dishonor his sacrifice. It is possible to just go through the motions, unengaged, dishonestly, disingenuous. And this is not just a religious ritual to do. Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. we got to think about this. God is concerned about our hearts. He desires that we have clean hearts. He desires that we be totally honest uh, before him. And he wants us to look at our own lives. He's given, giving, he knows where we stand, but he wants us to see it and to be honest about it. Um, he wants us to, to assess our spiritual condition today. He wants us just to admit our sin before him. That's, that's our job. Verse 28, everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink of the cup. So this is self-examination. Um, you get to be the judge of your own life. It's not our job around you to judge you. It's you get to judge your own life. Um, and when we do that, when God points out things that we know that displease him, then we need to be honest and just say, God, I'm sorry um, for this. Be specific. Would you forgive me? I'm just being humble before the Lordship of Christ. I don't deserve to be saved. I never will be deserved. I never will deserve to be saved. I'll never be good enough. And it's just humbly acknowledging that before God. Verse 29, for those who eat, the, eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ and eat and drink judgment on themselves. Now, this is not eternal judgment for a follower of Christ. The person who doesn't know Christ is already under judgment, John Chapter 3, verse 18. Um, but it's about God's evaluation. You know, we, we get to assess ourselves. Are we, are, are we going to be honest with God and does that align with what God thinks? And if we are sloppy and lazy and just go through the motions, then we can experience God's judgment on us as Christ followers, and it may have a big impact in our lives in the physical realm. That is possible. It's not a threat. It's just what the scriptures say. He says in verse 30, that is why many among you are weak and sick, and a number of you have fallen asleep. So weak and sick, that's physical. I'm not saying everybody who's sick and everybody who has physical issues or everyone who dies is under God's discipline as his children. I can't say that. I do not have the authority. Sometimes it's true. But sometimes it's true. Um, you who are weak 
You who are sick, a number of you already have fallen asleep, meaning already experienced physical death as believers. Fallen asleep. That's how the New Testament uh, describes death for a believer. Psalm chapter 139, a lot of you know this passage. Uh, it's a great prayer for us as we, as we get ready for communion today. Um, Psalm uh, 139, verse 23. Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. And I'd love for this to be on the screen so you can just read it as you think. Search me, God. Know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there's any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. That's a call to repentance. Search me, God. Show me what I need to do. And then lead me in a new way, a new path, the way everlasting. Um, memorials are for the purpose of remembering. We have memorials all over in our country. There's the Lincoln Memorial and the Washington Memorial in Washington, D.C. In Egypt, there are pyramids to remember pharaohs of Egypt. In India, there's the Taj Mahal to remember a woman. At the Vietnam um, Memorial, and probably many of you have been there. We got a chance to visit there uh, three or four years ago. You know, there's a list of names engraved on black marble, and people go there to remember their loved ones and their friends every day. And um, they leave things, and then at the end of the day, volunteers collect all of those items, and they are added to the Vietnam's memorial collection. One man left dog tags, a headband, and a letter that read, To all of you here from Echo Company, 1st Marines, uh, 1st Marine Regiment, 1st Marine Division, I leave you my headband which contains my sweat from the war, my dog tags, a picture of me and Mike, another time, another place. And then he says, I'll never forget you. A woman left a braid of hair and a picture of a house with an American flag hanging on the front porch. And her note said, Wayne, I think of you every day. I miss you so much. I love you. And then written on the flag were these words. May all of you who died, all of you still missing, all of you who returned home, never be forgotten. Jesus said he wanted to be remembered with the bread and the cup. And we do that. Now, our communion at the bridge is open, and uh, that means that if you're a follower of Christ, you don't have to be a member of our church, but if you're a follower of Christ, um, we, in, we invite you to, to join us. If you're not a follower of Christ, don't worry about it. Just relax. You don't have to be involved. So the way we celebrate communion is there are two stations up front, and in just a minute we'll invite you um, to to come to the front and uh, maybe uh, coming, coming down these two aisles <laughs> and uh, then uh, going back. But um, there's a seal on the top. I have to explain that because if you pull it off, the grape juice can run all over if you're not ready for it. So you pull off the, the first seal and there's a bread and then uh, you can take that after you go back to your seat, and then you can take off the next seal and you can take the, the grape juice uh, whenever you're ready for it. So I'd like to uh, bow. I'd like to return thanks uh, to God for uh, his provision and for the bread and the cup. Father, we just uh, pause before you. We understand the gift of salvation that you have given to us that you offer to all people. God, may our hearts be ready. May our hearts be right before you today. 
Search us and know our hearts and show us if there's anything inappropriate to you. And then guide us in your ways. And so just as um, we're, we're sitting here now, just take some time and process. Where are you in your spiritual life? Is there anything that would be displeasing to Christ? And just confess that to him. Just be honest. And then, God, we we just give you praise that you've made a provision for us to stay in fellowship with you, to walk with you day by day, to get back up when we fall down in our spiritual lives, when we sin. And you've given us the promise of 1 John 1, 9, that if we confess our sins, that you are faithful and just and will forgive us our sin and purify us from all unrighteousness. Thank Thank you, God, that... For everyone who confessed and was honest with you this morning that their sins are forgiven and they're cleansed from all unrighteousness. Thank you for the bread and thank you for the cup. Thank you for what Jesus did for us. May it be central to our thinking. May we never forget it. In Jesus' name, amen. So whenever you're ready, you may come to one of the stations and then go back.
There'll be a place, um, wastebasket as you go out there, wastebaskets in the lobby, you can dispose of your cups. We are reminded of what um, the Apostle Paul instructed us, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So today we are gathered, we are gathered here to worship, to celebrate what Jesus did for us. And tomorrow we're scattered, but the job is still the same. We have a mission. We are on mission to live out the proclamation of good news. Christ died for us. We've been crucified with Christ, and now we live by faith in the Son of God who loves us and gave himself for us. And he is in us to empower us. So next week, uh, what I should know about baptism. So... Stay tuned. Please come back. God bless you all. We're dismissed.